Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. Today we're checking in with State Senator Sharon Moriwaki. I feel like I know Sharon Moriwaki for 20 years. And the reason I feel that way is I, I know Sharon Moriwaki for 20 years. <laughs> it's been a great take... 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna, with her, we're going to take a look at the 2024 legislative session. Um, and we're, we're going to explore what the issues are, what the tone is, uh, and what the prospects are. Now, she was elected originally in 2018, so she's been there for six, I get this right, six years. And uh, we want to find out more about her background, we want to find out you know, what she does all day over there. I know she's very busy, but I am really delighted to have her on the show. Um, so, Sharon, welcome to the show. Welcome to Think Tech. You know Think Tech so well. You were part of the development of our organization, you know. It's really good to be here, Jay. It it really is nice to see you. It's been a while, so uh, nice to 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 see and be part of the Think Tech family. Exactly, and we are so happy to have you. So you're running again. I am. Um, is some kind of masochist? Why are you? <laughs> Why are you running again? You have so much to do. You're so busy. You're, you know, you got all these issues hanging all around you, and you 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 want to run again. Tell me about that. Well, you know, you get involved with a number of issues, and and it's really hard when you think my job isn't done yet, and I think that's why I'm running again. Um, the, the job never is over, but there are certain priority areas that I've started to work on, and and the the work isn't done. <laughs> so let's let's talk about your philosophy, your engagement with um, you know the community of, uh, of Hawaii, of your of your district, um, of the legislature. Your, your philosophy of dealing with people, your vision for the state. Can you just ramble a little bit and tell me about those things? You know, when I ran, it, we were fighting uh, the high rise luxury condos in Kaka'ako, and 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 it and I really didn't expect to be running. I think I picked the short straw. <laughs> and so <laughs> here I was. Um, because because the community didn't have a voice in Kaka'ako. It was a new area. We didn't even know what this organization called HCDA, Hawaii Community Development Authority. Uh, and we kept fighting it. it we said, where's the community in HCDA? community development, but there's no community. So it started that way. And I think that's been my philosophy all through um, the five, I guess now six years I've been here is to be a voice for the community, to be a voice for um, those of us who thought we had a voice, but really didn't have a voice uh, and to to try to bring that forward. So I, I do send out newsletters um, every, it was every day almost during the pandemic. So I've been through a lot with with um, with this term. Um, it was the first the pandemic when I first got in, and then it's now morphed into a line. <laughs> so one it's, thing after another, one, yeah. One thing after another um, that that we've been through. Uh, and all through that, problems haven't gone away. There's been the homeless problem. There's been um, the sea level rise problem, um, workforce development. We've got major shortage in people leaving the state because of the lack of affordable housing, the lack of jobs, the lack of training. Uh, so all of those are still in the forefront. And, and, and it's all very important for where we go um, in the future. Uh, and, and keeping our young people here, keeping them to thrive here and growing our economy. So it's all, all of this is still um, front and center. So I, I'm here to make sure that some of these problems that we have started work on actually see some, not the end of the tunnel, but some fruition that we've laid the foundation, the, the, real, the real strong foundation for a growing, thriving economy and young people staying here, um, and and keeping keeping track is you know we're 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 there, Jay. We've got to keep track of of keeping our elderly respected, honored, and cared for, and that's why um, I'm I'm also the uh, co-convener of what's called the Kupuna Caucus at the legislature. 
Oh, you're doing a program on that. So tell us about the program with the Kubuna Caucus. Yeah. yeah. It's um, so so over the years, and it, we've been focused on healthy aging, whether it's preventing falls, uh, making sure that we've got exercise programs that we we've been um, looking at uh, a number of different ways of keeping our elders healthy. But on the other end of the spectrum, there there is the the um, frail elders, and if we don't we don't watch ourselves and watch our diet and exercise, there's really on the other end of the spectrum, how do you age gracefully and and age in place as long as you can, and um, have services uh, when you get frail, and that's physical as well as um, with Alzheimer's and and dementia on that end of the spectrum. How do we make sure that we've got services there? Uh, to keep you as uh, the quality of life as as best we can to age in place. So so that's been the neglected part because it's so costly. Uh, I guess you know we we haven't talked about it. We haven't kept up with that because it is so costly. So that's that's great. Uh, we have the flyer for that. Can we show the flyer for that? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Can you tell us about what you know the program itself, uh, the gathering, so to speak? So that small little print at the top, we can't neglect long-term care anymore, is is really the the focus of what we've been looking at for the last couple of years now, is, is what is the future of long-term care? We've been talking a lot about healthy aging, but on the other hand, how do we look at um, a more a, a person-centered system of care at the other end of the spectrum? And we haven't been keeping up with with that that continuum. So a lot of times we're looking at skilled nursing facilities, but you know that um, we have the high demand, but the beds the beds are um, that that for for these the needs for 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 the frail elders, the nursing homes aren't taking people in. Why? Not because we we we, we don't have beds. It's because we have worker shortage, so they can't keep can't get people in because we we don't have the the, the staff oh. uh, and and the skilled staff trained staff to bring people in so on that end we've got a workforce shortage we need to look at how do we finance this because it is costly and on the other hand it's the home and community based services that are much less costly but we don't have the people on the on the being paid on the community-based services and which would really help our, because most of our elders want to stay at home. So how do we wrap services around them at the, at the home and community-based level and offset the cost that's really the high cost end, which is a skilled nursing visit. So those are the issues that, that we're looking at next week, actually, uh, and, and in both, in a work session with about 60 providers that we're bringing in um, resources from across the country, letting us know what has worked, what hasn't worked, and looking at that and taking that forward to a legislative briefing um, before my colleagues um, in terms of what is what is the system of care that we should have that's focused on the person they can go in and out of services, and how do we do that? And what is the kind of workforce we need to be training them? And ultimately, how do we fund that? How do we fund that in a way that, that we really can sustain a system where people really get the quality care that they need at the time they need it? Yeah, there's jobs there too. So uh, you tell us, tell us, uh, can we attend? Can the public uh, come to this? Or how, how do we do it? When and where? So it's going to be at the legislature, at the Capitol, the state Capitol Auditorium, where we used to have the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum briefings. Same mm -hmm. thing. It's going to be there, and it's going to be um, from 1 to 3 down in the auditorium, and it'll be on uh, next Thursday from 1 to 3 p.m. Please come. We want a whole lot of people to hear the challenges and possible solutions. And we do have a number of bills 
that we're following. And we hope that that everybody will get involved and know what kinds of programs we're trying. One is a major one is a master plan for long-term care. And we really would like you to get involved, testify, make sure that we do that. And then the next year we start working really seriously on uh, having a long-term care plan and, and really having a system of care that, that would really help everybody in the long run. We all will get old and need care. Well, let me, let me uh, tell you, you know, that so many of my friends, including retired lawyers that I have known over the years are getting old now and they're getting sick and they need help. And, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter what they did in their lives. The fact is that right now, if they get older, um, it, it's, a, it's a humanitarian thing uh, that we need to provide for them, give them a, what do you want to call it, a, a soft life landing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, it is a crisis in many ways for many people. It tears your heart out to see what happens to them. So I compliment you on this issue, on attending to this issue, on attending to the Kapuna Caucus uh, and setting up this program. And it reminds me, actually, of um, one of the threads in your original campaign, getting into the Senate in 2018, is where you articulated that we need to care for each other. And you have been faithful to that all these years. You really have, Sharon. And, and I, 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 I care a lot about you caring. And I, I, I must say that um, you are unique in that way because you really do care. And this is an expression of that caring. And we should all, you know, get on board with that. Let me also add that you're a great communicator. You were a great communicator in the Energy Policy Forum, and you attracted people from all sides of the energy industry as never, never before and never after. And, and bottom line is, uh, you're the kind of person who draws who draws people around, and you you know you create community wherever you go. That's that's what it was like in the Energy Policy Forum, and uh, and when you send out your newsletters, I am always impressed where that shows through. It shows through every time I get one of your newsletters. So thank you for being caring all these years. Thank you, and thank you for remembering that has been my theme: caring for each other. And it's kind of schmaltzy. <laughs> but I do mean it. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, you know, you talk about your district. Your district runs uh, you know, all along Bye. the south shore of Oahu. It's a huge district, and it's, it's a diverse district. It's a diverse district in terms of the people, the, you know, the, the demography, and in terms of the businesses there, includes Waikiki, for example. And can you talk about your district and how you relate to your district and, and how your district, uh, you know, has been and how it's changing and what it's like now? Thank you, Jay. Yeah, it, it is a very diverse, dynamic district. It covers Waikiki, Kaka'ako, Makali, uh, and, and the Ala Moana area. So it's quite diverse. Um, we've got the hotels. We've got uh, on, the, on the Waikiki side. But the what connects them all is this coastline. And that's why sea level rise has been really concerned. And we've been looking at projects to look at how do we, how do we manage the coastline, sea level rise, and climate change. Um, and, and then on the Kaka'ako side, we've got young professionals, people who are really uh, looking at technology, looking at how we can can really develop a workforce that is, I say, the future. So we've got this sandbox, the Entrepreneur Sandbox, Highway Technology Development Corporation, all there in Kaka'ako. We also have the John A. Burns School of Medicine there, and also um, the, the uh, Cancer Center, Cancer Research Center. So all of that is really quite um, oh, the other thing we have is is the creative media is sitting there in um, the sandbox. So we've got a lot of um, real talent and and the, the future, healthcare, creative industries, as well as technology. It's just that it hasn't kind of come to fruition. But those are all again the future and the economic development that's in Kaka'ako. So we've got the hotels and 
and and the resort, but looking at destination management, what that means and how is it changing the the, the face of Waikiki. We've got Kaka'ako and healthcare and technology um, beaming and and really could be blossoming in Kaka'ako if they all got together. And then and then you've got the older community of Makali Ili'ili area, um, which is starting to develop and and you know what do we do with an aging community? But that that really is um, still very vibrant with with a lot of past and a lot of um, cultural past that can be developed close to the university. So it's very diverse, uh, and trying to pull that all together. Um, the one thing that <laughs> which is a negative that keeps everybody together is noise crime and homeless <laughs> so we're working on that as well in a um trying to be again um as we 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 have been doing with energy policy forum or with the kupuna caucus is with the homeless is is pulling together the agencies that serve the homeless and being able to connect so that we actually help them get off the street to a better place. You know, um, you talk about uh, tourism and hospitality in Waikiki, but and that leads to a, a discussion of, uh, of Maui. Um, Maui, very, very tragic, tragic for the economy also. Um, and of course, um, you, you know, uh, you're a state senator, that's statewide, and uh, you're, mm, your, your area really goes beyond any one district, and certainly it goes to trying to deal with recovery in, in Maui. Can you tell us about what the ledge is doing or could do um, to help Maui? You know, I, I do sit on the Ways and Means Committee, and I, I have to, um, I really have to applaud my chair, Donovan De La Cruz, uh, because we, in the Ways and Means Committee, as we did with the pandemic, we've always been asking the questions because we have to balance the budget. We've been asking what's going on. And if it weren't for um, the questioning of how much are we spending on Lahaina? Because as you know, there was a lot of private monies going into Lahaina uh, as well as county monies. But the state, the state has been at the forefront. We thought the budget, the budget amount the governor gave us was $200 million a year over three years. So budgeting $600 million over a three-year period. When we started asking the questions, asking the Hawaii um, Emergency Management um, uh, Agency, HAIMA, also the budget and finance, the finance director, uh, and, and the Department of Human Services, because they serve a lot of the, the needs of the, the community, um, asking them for, for, for figures, it's, they say it's a moving, it's a moving figure. Um, but the estimate is about, instead of the $200 million a year over three years, it's the whole $600 million in, in this fiscal year, in one wow. year time. And that's yeah. when the red flags went up and we started having these briefings. We had a briefing last week with all the departments uh, and we brought in the county this, this week. Uh, and over the weekend, all of that information that we Ways and Means Committee has asked of the different departments has been eye-opening and very disturbing. And so uh, we had a briefing and we're gonna have another, we called in the mayor, um, and it was disturbing because I don't think the county even was accounting for what they needed and how much they're actually paying and how much the state has been uh, paying. And so uh, all of that has come to pass. In fact, one of the things that, that the, what the council members said is, thank you so much, Ways and Means Committee, for having this hearing because we had not even known all of this until you brought it out. So the county hasn't been, the council hasn't been connected to the mayor, hasn't been connected to the state. So, so I think it's, it's very disturbing and we are um, 
starting to look at all of the costs and trying to get all of that together. Wow, that's a really hard issue. In fact, all the issues you've mentioned are hard issues uh, where we really need to address them. We, we need to find solutions. We, we have to make this a state where people stay, they don't leave, make this a state where we're prosperous, we have a quality of life, um, and, you know, and everybody enjoys that quality of life. These are hard issues, um, and you've been working on them. I know you've talked about them, um, and uh, you know, I know that uh, you're not going to stop. I know this from the Energy Policy Forum. You're not going to stop. You're determined, and you <laughs> keep on going and going. <laughs> so so what, what's going on in this session? Um, there's got to be a, some... center. Uh, you know, as I say, Lahaina is front and center yeah. uh, and, and, and we've got to get a handle on how much we're spending. You know, one of the biggest problems and, and, and I'll share it with you because it came out, you know, in our last briefing with, with the county and the departments is that we, we thought it was a 90, 10 split with the, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, FEMA. Um, and it is, if you're FEMA eligible, what they're finding out, and there's maybe 29 people who are COFA, you know, the, the Micronesian, um, they're, they're, they're not uh, FEMA eligible, but everybody else, it's, it's really, they should, we thought they would be FEMA eligible, but we're finding that, that we're, we're having to haggle on, on who's eligible or not. If you were in condos, it wasn't, you weren't eligible. And I think that's gotten straightened out. But the numbers weren't coming in. And and all of the people who are in what they call non-congregate sheltered, the sheltering area um, is, is where you're not into some kind of temporary or permanent housing. They are they are living in the Ka'anapali hotels. They're called non-congregate because they don't have any facilities for cooking. So we are paying for each household a thousand dollars a day for the hotel at at whatever rate FEMA said they pay. Um, the hotels, the food, the wraparound services. Each household, each day, we're paying a thousand dollars a day and the state said, okay, the governor said, okay, we'll, we'll pay for that. And so that, that really is a big, big chunk of money. It's, it's like a thousand dollars. And at that point, we thought a thousand families of households, that's a million dollars a day going, wow. going out the door. So what, what we've been pushing the county and, 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 um, the, the the agencies and and um, working with with well, primarily the county and our our housing agencies is how do you get them out of the hotels and into temporary housing that we're not paying a thousand dollars a day because in temporary housing you've got your you you pay for your own expenses you've got you know your your kitchen you've got you know you you can you can cook and you you don't need to have all of this, the the Cost that's that's really mounting up daily on our tab. Uh, that's problematic because uh, they may like staying in hotels. They may like having all that around them. And this at the is same time. Yeah. Is at the same time, you if if they refuse, and it hasn't happened yet, but the policy that FEMA has is if they tell you you must move somewhere else, and you say no, I don't want to go. You've got two chances, and if you refuse two times, then you're FEMA ineligible, which means they come onto our state table. Oh, wow. So, so we really are are pushing to move them off of out of the hotels and into some kind of temporary. And that was the whole problem with with Maui on the on the short term rentals of pulling people back into long term rentals at least to, to house these these survivors it's a big wow. problem it's a big problem and not without its challenges on all sides of the equation and yet so, the state has all these others homeless workforce development sea level rise our keiki uh, people right. housing those are still our our responsibility so yeah it it, it, it is um 
major balancing and uh, we are still responsible for all of our residents. Yes. You know, I looked at the list of bills that you've been associated with um, just, just this year, in this session. And I said to myself, we are never, ever going to have time to go through all these bills. <laughs> <laughs> there were dozens and dozens of them. And I guess that's, you know, that's the Ways and Means Committee. It, you know, it, uh, it extends across all, all boundaries in the legislature because of the, you know. Uh, a thousand the, bills. If you... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, we don't hear all of them because the, the subject matter committees, we read most of them out. But we're, we heard, we heard about 30, 40 bills today in Ways and Means Committee. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, that's you have to have plenty of energy, and I know you do have plenty of energy. <laughs> no pun, in, no pun intended. <laughs> that's where we started, right? Jay? Yeah, that's where we started. <laughs> so I was going to ask you my question about what kind of a session is this? You know, because every session has its own personality; it has its own moment in history, uh, and it can be distinguished from all other sessions in the past and maybe in the future. Uh, why does this session, how is this session different uh, from other sessions that you have seen? I, you know, I think every session is different uh, and every session is alike. I think um, if you're saying what distinguishes this session, I think we came into it um, anxious about how we're going to deal with Lahaina mm. and, and the tragedy uh, we all are very compassionate, you know, we really want to help the survivors and then, you know, it's, but, but as the bills come, become greater and greater of what we don't know, um, there is this real um, anxiety of the unknown, because we do have to balance the budget. Uh, we do have lots of needs. I, I, you know, I have all these grants and aids are coming in. The capital improvement projects are coming in. All of the bills are coming in with from mental health to substance abuse to to Medicaid and and needing to help the elderly to to education programs. Um, it's it, it really is how much can we help Lahaina in terms of getting them on their feet and working and 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 helping them but also taking care of all these other needs so i think it's it is it is uh i think it's a period of of uh, unknown uncertainty but need to, to move forward the thought i've had is that you know even without the tragedy of what happened uh, in maui um there's plenty of work to be done to get us in the right place to preserve our quality of life and our economy and so forth. And then on top of that, you have Maui, which is like a hole in our head. Um, and so now your your work and your challenge and your you know concern doubles and triples because you know we haven't seen it yet, but we know that Maui will affect the state economy. We know that'll happen. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just uh, heard that, that the tourism numbers are actually down right now. And that's, maybe that's a result of people's perception of how Maui affects the hospitality industry across the state. So we have to be very mindful of the economy with this new and profound complication. And that's got to be, you know, as you say, uh, a concern and anxiety in this session. I, I feel that. I feel, and you can agree or disagree, um, that we we have a kind of precariousness here. We have to, we have to cope with this because if we don't cope with it, the other problems will will undermine our the quality of our economy and our lives. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. You know, and and when I said this is no different than other sessions, as well as it's different from other sessions, is that. You know, I remember um, going through the pandemic, the same thing, um, in, in the sense of we were uncertain. We didn't know the economy collapsed because, you know, we couldn't get tourists to come. And, and then we had to mask up. It's that anxiety. And yet we got through that. 
Um, but it was we, our our um, our um, economy was going up just before the pandemic. Likewise, we were we were going back up before Lahaina. So so you know it is the vicissitude of life or what, wherever now these days with disasters being very much almost normal because of sea level rise, of climate change, we are getting more disasters. So we have to, um, I think, be much more resilient as people as, as well as, you know, trying to be a resilient in terms of our environment is, is that we have to just expect change and, and learn to, um, uh, to not cope, but to to be in front of it, to to always be expecting change, and you know, I I know that as we talk about change in state government and working with the technology um, groups, is is that you were on the technology committee also, weren't you? Yeah. yeah, and it's you know, if you look at AI and the re on the generative AI and all of these new things that are coming at us, is not to be afraid of it, to be to be able to tackle it and understand it and and be aware that that it's it's all around us and you, you can't be doing the same old same old as comfortable as it is it's more discomforting to stay in that space than to say what's out there and how can i be on top of it or in front of it or find different ways on which we can look at what's around us you know it's it's difficult it really is difficult but every day is different these days yeah well you know sharon i i really feel comfortable and confident to have you in the legislature in the state senate no, no. I, mean, I, know, I know you well enough to know that you're akamai about the state about the prospects for the state about the economy for the state about the workforce you know you been around all of that. I, I'm not going to go through your bio now. Your bio is on the legislative website, but it, it it tells us that you know about these things from long experience, firsthand on the ground experience. And I'm I must say I'm I'm really happy um, that you're there. I'm, I I feel better about the state when I think of that. Um. So um. Thank you for serving. Thank you for doing public service. You don't have to do that. You choose to do that. And it is encouraging to see you do what you do. The other, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Sharon, is what would you like to leave with our viewers as a message? What should they be thinking about in terms of you know the way the ledge interacts uh, with other parts of government, the way the ledge interacts with the community in general? I, I think your your comments uh, about how the ledge and your committee does this kind of oversight thing. Um, you know, to protect our our fiscal policy and all that. That's really important. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to ask you what you think people should see the ledge as, uh, how they should feel about the way things are working. I I guess mm, that's difficult um, to answer because you know I think people have different perceptions oh the corruption or you know this one and and you attack this person because that person did wrong yeah of course there's always going to be a normal curve of good guys and bad guys and all the in between is you know even more um but i think the the one thing i i leave the viewers with is that we're all in this together um i'll tell you my colleagues are all thinking they're doing their best to represent you um, we may have different views of how we see that, and we, you know, we're all different people, but we all try to hear from you. We ask you to write to us or email us, and I get a lot of emails, <laughs> and but they're very different. <laughs> He's everybody, but we do want to know what concerns you, and we try our best. But you know, again, we're working as one person in the Senate. I'm one of twenty-five. And the House, there's 51 others. So we need to get a majority vote when we get anything passed. So we take your comments. We make bills. Some of, you know, I've got a lot of bills because it's trying to represent what the interests are um, and the concerns are for, for 
for our community. And we go and we we try to influence our our um, our colleagues to vote for those bills and get them out. But uh, in the end, they go to committees. They go to whether it's the higher education committee or the energy committee. And it really requires all of you to go and testify to say this is important because I have been the chair of the committee and if nobody testifies, hey, nobody cares about this one, let's just defer, let's kill this one, we'll move on because we've got, you know, 200 other bills. So it really is important not only to, to let us know, but don't just depend on one person, it really takes a majority vote to get anything through and it really requires everybody weighing in and not just a few and sometimes you have the few who weigh in and they just are just one-sided so it really does take everybody to weigh in of what impacts you and what you want and what you don't want and, and again people will vote and say we don't like that well it's not just that we don't like that the, the the whole legislative process is a hearing to hearing to hearing like six times in different committees that each time you have a chance to change that bill to make it better so by the time it comes to the end of the process and we go to a conference we would have heard from many voices and we have to massage it to get the best bill we can to move out or we defer it we kill it so it's a long process, but a fast paced process that requires everybody to weigh in if you really are concerned about something. You know, I get people complaining all the time. I say, testify. We write the bills, but you got to testify and make it better. Mm. So I leave it. Take, <clears throat> takes a village. Yeah, no. And as, as we always say, the yeah. government is us and we are the government. It's a two-way street. It's a collaboration of the whole community. And I must say that in our experience uh, together, Sharon, you're, you're a great communicator and a great listener. And I would always feel comfortable expressing my views to you. And uh, uh, I, I hope you can come back and talk to us about some of the, the various bills that are still cooking around uh, and that are on that long list of bills and talk about other you know, extensions of policy, discussions around fiscal policy that affect them. Thank you so much. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki, Senator uh, in the Hawaii State Senate and longtime friend of Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you. It's a pleasure always to be with you, Jay, and with Think Tech. Aloha. Aloha.